Welcome to Radical AI, a podcast about radical ideas, radical people, and radical stories at the intersection of ethics and artificial intelligence. We are your hosts, Dylan and Jess. In this episode, we interview Dr. Beth Singler, a junior research fellow in artificial intelligence at the University of Cambridge. Previously, Beth was the postdoctoral research associate on the Human Identity in an Age of Nearly Human Machines project at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion. Through her research, Beth explores the social, ethical, philosophical, and religious implications of advances in artificial intelligence and robotics. We cover a lot of ground in this interview, and some of the topics that we discuss are, what's up with AI and consciousness? What is religious studies, and how does it relate to AI? How can science fiction be used to reimagine speculative futures and get the public involved in the AI ethics conversation? And finally, why is it important to distinguish between science fiction and science fact when it comes to the future of AI? I want to thank Beth so much for coming on the show, as Beth is someone who is really leading the way at this intersection between philosophy, religious studies, and artificial intelligence. And for me, as someone who's in a religious studies program, uh, it's just really cool to see other people who are out there who are uh, paving the way for folks like me to, you know, even have a career in the future. Um, And so I'm just so grateful for Beth for her continued, not only that, that trailblazing, but also her mentorship. Uh, as I continue to discern my own PhD research. So without further ado, we are so happy and excited to share this interview with Dr. Beth Singler with all of you. We're here on the line with Dr. Beth Singler. Beth, how are you doing today? I am melting. It's very, very hot in the UK at the moment. So if I just fade away, that's the reason. (laughs) Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And uh, I guess let's begin at the beginning. Um, So if you could tell us a little bit about uh, your journey to what you're doing now and a little bit about what you're doing now and what motivates you. Well, I was born on the south coast of... No, I won't go go that quite that far back. Um, So where to begin? Well... I am a research fellow at Cambridge at one of the colleges um, and that basically means I'm paid and employed for a period of time to look at my area of interest which uh, with this fellowship is artificial intelligence that follows on from my last postdoc position but I didn't really start out looking at AI. So my background is in what well, the degree would be called theology and religious studies, but I'm always been more the kind of social anthropology of religion and new religious movements side of things. So I did all my degrees at Cambridge. They kept having me back, which seems silly, but they did. Um, and I focused on contemporary new religious movements that have a, a strong presence online. So I was looking at digital identity, digital social formation, communities and groups. Um, And then out of that, I got my first postdoc after my PhD. And and that was the role that took me into looking at artificial intelligence. And I do see overlap in my work. Um, I suppose there's a tendency, perhaps if you've done religious studies, to think of everything through a religious studies lens. But I I still think uh, looking at the artificial intelligence ecosystem kind of the collection network of concepts and ideas around this very nebulous thing this object this entity in this field um, there are similarities with some of the work I was doing previously on new religious movements and groups that focus on technological answers to their problems so there's an overlap I feel between some of the the new age groups I was looking at before and Jediism and Scientology that I'd looked at as well and modern forms of transhumanism and artificial intelligence, futurism, and the the kind of utopianism that we see in some of the discussions around AI. So I'm still I'm still primarily an anthropological person in focus. Uh, it has taken me a little bit my current work into discussing the issues around ethics and society when it comes to AI, but I don't generally claim to be an ethicist. <laughs> I think that's too big a hat for me to be wearing, but 
I'm very interested in the different discussions that are going on and who is having them. For folks, um, so I'm I'm in a religious studies program uh, currently, and it's taken me even a while to understand what religious studies is and what it isn't. <laughs> Um, and then also in mentioning uh, new religious movements, and I'm wondering for folks at home who might not know what those things are, or what those, uh, w- what you study, if you could just unpack that. A little. <laughs> yeah, so religious studies is uh, basically an approach looking at religion using a broad range of methods and methodologies. So uh, as I say, I'm primarily anthropological in focus, but you also get people who take a more of a historical lens to the history of religions, uh, sociological lenses. Um, you can you can find literature studies people. I think one of the wonderful things about religious studies is it's very accepting of different approaches and methodologies. It's it's not the same thing as theology, although as I said, my degree originally was theology and religious studies. Theology, well, from my experience here in the UK, it tends to be a little bit more um, confessional. So people who hold beliefs want to explore primarily monotheistic interpretations of God, uh, Abrahamic faiths. Um, so I'm not I'm not coming from that kind of perspective. I'm looking at religion as a religious study scholar, as a, a social phenomena, a cultural phenomena, uh, something that integrates communities and expresses the stories and ideas we have of the world. And I think I'm very interested in the diversity of those. And in my particular research, I've kind of started to think more and more about how technology is a, is a worldview as well. So I think, and for, for the new, sorry, the new religious movements would be, uh, there's there's a lot of discussion as with the discussion of what the definition of a religion is, the definition of how new is a new religious movement. Um, but what I've looked at is primarily groups and new forms of religion that have merged online since the ni- late 90s with the emergence of the internet really as a really public popular force. Uh, Some people doing new religious studies will go back to groups that were formed in the 1800s, the 1900s, but for me it's 20th and 21st century groups. So while Dylan is the resident religious studies scholar, uh, I am the resident uh, quote-unquote technologist, though we still aren't exactly sure what that word means. So what I'm curious about is when AI came into the picture for you, and if there's a particular moment you can remember where you realized that AI was a part of your work. Well, personally, AI probably came a about as an interest for me through science fiction. So I've always been a geek. It took me a long time to be a self-proclaimed geek and to say that in more general society, because when I grew up, I'm very old. When I grew up, it was a little less uh, acceptable to say you liked things like Star Trek and Babylon 5 and all of the various things that I grew up watching. Um, So it did take me a while to kind of accept and take on board that personality and that persona. But um, Yes, from the very earliest days of my televisual watching and my book reading, it was always science fiction and fantasy. But, you know, the the AI element came through the science fiction. um, And yes, Lieutenant Commander Data was very influential on my original thinking about what we mean by AI. What is an artificial being? In terms of my academic career, that was never really a strong through line. I I, I did look, uh, I did some work around Jediism. I actually have some more bits coming out about real world Jediism. And obviously that's science fiction slash fantasy with droids and robots in it. But it really wasn't until my first postdoc, my first position after my PhD, that I was hired onto a project that was already going to look at artificial intelligence. And they wanted basically a social scientist, someone who could do the ethnographic work, who was also a geek which is great, it's me, um, who could look at artificial intelligence. And I, I sort of quickly kind of boned up on AI for the interview, basically to say, well, I haven't really looked at this before, but I've been reading X, Y, Z. Um, and that's the, the position that really brought me into the field of AI. And that's what I've continued to do with my current role. Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, what you said about science fiction and leading people towards geekdom or whatever we <laughs> want to call it. And I noticed actually on your website that you have some uh, fiction stories that you've written before. <laughs> so uh, could you tell us a little bit about the role that you think science fiction can play in artificial intelligence and imagining potential futures? Yeah, I mean, I, I have got a couple of not brilliant short stories. I like I call them more like doodles than, you know, these aren't my, uh, this isn't me launching into a career as a science fiction author because I'm by no means that good but I do enjoy writing my previous 
career before I came back to academia was as a screenwriter and a script developer. So that's something that I occasionally pick up and play with. Um, I think there is an interesting conversation to be had definitely around the role of science fiction and the boundaries between science fiction and science fact. So some of my more uh, critical work when it comes to the AI ecosystem is about people who kind of push those boundaries a bit too far and are presenting things as science fact when actually they're more mythical and made up. And I have a couple of examples, which I'll probably get into trouble for mentioning, but um, I think it's important that the general public know when a, a presentation of AI is real and when it's science fiction. And I'm all for the multitudes of science fiction, obviously being a Star Trek fan. But when I sit down in front of the television and press play, I know that is me interacting with a fictional story. If I see a news report that says, in many cases, this is the most sparkling brand new example of AI and it's going to change the world and it's not what it claims to be, then I think that's terrible and disingenuous. So I have played around with science fiction in my own work, but uh, I think there is a space for speculative futures, but with disclaimers that these are speculative futures. It almost sounds like there's an ethical element uh, as well. And I'm wondering... um... I'm wondering where that line is. And where I'm coming from is as someone who uh, did my uh, Master's of Divinity, which is a theological degree, and now I'm doing religious studies, which is more moving towards like anthropology and sociology and like the study of as opposed to that confessional element that you were talking about. And I'm, I'm wondering when it comes to something like Scientology, for example, which has been historically in trouble for some ethical decisions or not decisions, consent, things like that, um, where where that line is and how how do we delineate it? And then if you can tie it into AI, um, that would be great too. (laughs) Yeah, Um, so I wrote a paper recently, unfortunately it got rejected from the first journal I sent it to, but maybe maybe it'll find a home, but um, it was off of a a presentation I gave at the American Academy of Religion conference last year about this, uh, this wavering line, this kind of blurring of science fiction and science fact, and that actually some of our attempts at telling stories about AI become more about manifested aspiration. And I tried to tie this into a longer history of um, movements like spiritualism, that if you know anything about the history of spiritualism and the, the attempts to kind of manifest seances, that they use the technology of the time, in some cases photography, like the, the burgeoning technology of the time, to make real the things that they really hoped were real. And I see elements of that with Scientology. I don't flat out refute the ontological reality of Scientology. As religious studies scholars, I don't think we should ever do that. What I get concerned about, as you say, is the ethical issues and the potential abuses, which you know run gamut through all sorts of different religious groups. But I think, again, it kind of comes down to this almost the red flag disclaimer thing of, of knowing the sources where they come from and having as much education as possible. And the thing with groups like Scientology, they some of them limit education for their members. So they dissuade them from looking online to find out more about where some of these ideas came from and what they're connected to. And as we know with L. Ron Hubbard, he started out in science fiction. So then again, there's that blurring when his science fiction stories then start being the prime texts for the group and all the things about the Thetans and so forth. So there there has to be a kind of a general literacy around religion. And that's where I think religious studies can be so useful because we do dig around. We have historians, we have anthropologists and sociologists. We dig around and find out where these ideas come from, how they're connected to each other and where in specific instances the ideas have, you know, fictional roots and then get employed in different ways. And then when it comes to AI, I think that's an area in in particular where religious studies has not been specifically employed, but not to, again, as I say, see everything through a religious studies lens, because that's my background. But I think, again, you see the same sorts of patterns. Again, everything is sparkling and brand new, but we're using actually the same sorts of language about AI that we have historically about theistic concepts. And that's where a lot of my work tends to go at the moment. While we're still on this topic of of science fiction and public scholarship and spreading information to the world, uh, one thing that I've seen uh, of yours that I really enjoy is your short documentary films uh, called Rise of the Machines about AI and the future uh, and implications of AI and robotics. And I would love if you could uh, share with our audience what motivated you to create those and um, what the response has been like, what, what the entire experience was. 
Yeah, I mean, that came about, and I, I should make it really clear that those are a team effort. So, you know, they sometimes get called my films, but there were, there were lots of people involved. And if you look through the credits, and originally uh, it came out of my first postdoc. So the institute I was at at the time, they, you know, through the project I was on, funded the first one in collaboration with the university. And then we got other funding involved. So absolutely, if you have a look, like see who's been involved in the companies and so forth. So it wasn't solely off my back because I, as I said, I'm not actually much of a technologist myself. I, I didn't have the skills to go and produce films, but I, I could be there in the creation of the storyline of each film. So they, as I said, they started with my, my previous postdoc. They ran over into this current postdoc and Really, the aim at, at the very beginning for me was, again, this feeling of that I was coming into AI as a relatively new field for me, uh, had that kind of general geek interest, but no real technical skills or knowledge of the, the debates and the discussion. So making the films in part was about educating myself as well. Um, and then also noticing quite how poor the the general kind of awareness of AI was. I was uh, recounted this story in, in trying to get funding once that... I'd been in a taxi and the taxi driver very kindly said, so how are you doing today? What are you up to? And what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I work in AI. And he said, oh, artificial insemination. That's very interesting. So there's, again, there's this general populist understanding of AI, either as um, quite often this hugely terrifying dystopic thing or this overhyped mythical thing that's going to come and save us all, or for some people kind of in a third party don't really have any kind of understanding of what the main issues are and why there's a big discussion at the moment. So having short-ish films, we, we tried to keep them under about 15 minutes each. And that was always quite humorous to me when we got to the fourth one, which is about consciousness and going, right, we're just going to deal with the whole of consciousness in about 15 minutes. Um, and we got together some really great expert voices. And that was kind of, again, part of my learning process that there were people out there that you hear of and you're like, can we actually get an interview with them and find out what they think and how they can explain this subject both to me and to the audience. Um, and I, th I think they did pretty well, the films. Um, they haven't, you know, blown up massively virally, but the people who've seen them have been very positive. And we won an award for the first one from uh, the AHRC here in the UK for Best Research Film of the Year Award. I got to wear a sparkly dress and I got to go to BAFTA and pick up a, an award. It was brilliant. But uh, the main thing, again, was just to think that there is there are so many ways we can connect with the public and get them involved in this discussion about AI, because otherwise they'll remain kind of fed on a diet of these headlines about killer robots when what they should be worried about is more the invisible killer robots of the algorithmic systems that are behind the scenes and already starting to make decisions about their lives and they have no awareness that this is happening. So having publicly accessible, engaging films is one way into helping people into that discussion. One of the things that I really uh, admire about your scholarship and your work is that you're such a, a master uh, storyteller um, and it, I, one of the things I appreciate about this conversation as well is that we're talking about the stories that get told about artificial intelligence. Um, and again, coming from the, the theistic lens, the religious studies lens, um, I'm curious about what stories you're seeing being told about artificial intelligence in terms of those almost, um, I don't want to say godlike, but I feel like sometimes artificial intelligence gets either elevated to God or like denigrated to the devil. Um, and I'm wondering if that's an accurate statement um, and kind of what you're seeing in those theistic um, modalities. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think we we respond more to stories at those kind of very binary ends of the spectrum. So the hugely dystopian or the hugely utopian and the impact and power of things like the Terminator series, that every time there's a story about AI in the press, they tend to, in the UK certainly, and, and the press I'm looking at, they tend to illustrate it with pictures of the Terminator. It's very evocative imagery. It immediately tells the audience, the reader, what they should expect. Or like the, the complete opposite, the utopianism of, you know, AI will solve of all our problems and it will end up basically being this super powered super intelligent super being that it seems to be fitting more and more into the space that some people might argue has been left by the death of god i'm doing quotation marks there because i'm very skeptical if you read any of my stuff about um the, the whole sectorization of the west i think this is a this is a meta narrative there's some really great people have written about this meta narrative of the the death of religion basically and it, it gets very tied up with ai narratives more broadly this idea that 
humanity as a whole is becoming more rational. AI is a part of this increasing rationality and therefore like religion as an irrational thing is going to disappear. And But actually with the stories we're telling about AI, it seems increasingly that the enchantment remains to use like a Weberian term. We're not becoming disenchanted by any means. We try and compare ourselves to other nations and locations and say, well, they're much more superstitious and irrational. And we're, we went through the enlightenment and we're serious thinkers now and AI is a serious project but actually if you look at our, our ways of discussing AI they're still very enchanted they're very um liminal um I discuss in many places how AI is a liminal entity it's it's somewhat like a ghost or a, a, a a chimera creature that can fulfill so many of our different desires and aspirations and we place so many expectations upon it that it's always this changing entity um so i think it's quite interesting that we we have these variety of views and some are more dominant than others uh, like i say the terminator imagery does tend to get more clicks for newspapers so they they go with that sort of thing um but you see both of them. And in the more utopian side, recently I've been looking at the kind of theistic interpretations of the algorithm as being in control and either blessing us or in some smaller cases, cursing us. So people finding that their content that they're producing and they're uploading on YouTube, if they have a particularly good day and they get lots of hits and likes, like, oh, you know, I've been blessed by the algorithm. Uh, and using theistic religious colored language to explain what's happening because what seems like a very obscure process is benefiting us or in some cases not benefiting us um it seems to we then seem to sort of fit into existing ways of talking we pull on religious terms and language to explain what's going on and some of that's tongue-in-cheek but i've written previously um in the case of jediism about how things that can start up quite tongue-in-cheek can end up being quite serious and part of the more general kind of um, populace's conscious conception of things like AI. Beth, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> so you're telling stories about uh, utopian futures, dystopic futures with AI. Do you envision the future of AI as a utopia or a dystopia? So are you an AI optimist or a pessimist and why? Uh, I'm an annoying anthropologist and we tend to remain or we try to kind of practice the sort of methodological ag agnosticism. So I'm neither a true believer nor a true like, you know, fearful, scared person. I think the, the, the truth is probably a lot closer to what William Gibson said when he said the future's already here. It's just unequally distributed. The good aspects of AI, the things that we could leverage into something like a utopia are going to be here, but they're going to be here for certain people. And the bad aspects are going to be here for probably more people. That sounds on the whole pessimistic, um, but we still have the opportunity and the choices to make to ensure that as many people as possible receive the benefits. What I'm also very cautious about is a sort of teleological view, which everything I just said could be just defined as a, a teleological view that I'm saying this is going to happen. But the assumption that technological progress can only lead to artificial intelligence of a superior kind and this is the thing that will change our society and this is the only way to go to my mind seems quite limiting um if you're familiar with like the foundation series and asimov this idea that this this is the direction this is the kind of escape of the future that we want perhaps there's a completely different future that we could look for but if we get too tied into this one technology and whatever benefits it can bring we might not be able to see those we might become blind now i'm not enough of i'm not good enough of a futurist to suggest what other technologies might become more prevalent but i think in the last at least 10 years it has become this more more and more mono focus on artificial intelligence uh, without the scope to actually say, well, maybe we don't want that. I, I appreciate your comments on, on teleology because it's also kind of how we've gotten into these oppressive structures, right? If you look back at philosophy of like Hegel, Kant, and like, oh, it's 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 coming and I can use that to justify colonialism or slavery and, and all that. Um, and uh, But I'm curious about this concept of technology. Um, and like in general, like do you, do you see AI, like how do you define technology, I guess, in your work? Um, and is like the technology of say a wheel the same as we're seeing in AI or are those different? And if so, why? Uh, yeah, so I would, I would define technology quite broadly. Um, I, I like to make a distinction perhaps between small T technology, big T technology, because that's how 
I mean, there are different ways of responding to the future brought about by technology. And I think for some people, it is more of a big T thing. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think absolutely I accept any argument that says we've always used technology. There isn't actually a way to distinguish the human from the technological. And actually the human is made, as uh, Latour said, we have never been modern. I'd also argue we've never not been technological as well. Um, but there is this this more recent narrative of big T technology. There is this thing that we can look back probably only to like the 20th century and say computers, better computers, better and better and better. And that is that is what we think of as big T technology. That is the thing that is driving what's happening next. Um, and I think that's, that's a worrying teleology with that, certainly. Uh, and I don't know where that ultimately would take us. And that's where my agnosticism comes in about what the future may bring. But uh, I think it's interesting that we've we've kind of reified a certain aspect of technology. Um, and to go back to AI as to whether it's a distinct form of technology, what I think is interesting about it is it's the probably, probably and that someone may disprove this for me, it's probably the first technology that we've ever tried to personify quite as much as we have with AI. It's, the discussion isn't just about, oh, computers will make things better and easier and faster. It's that computers, AI, machines, however you want to frame it, will be something new and separate to us. So like the emergence almost of an alien life form. And that's a narrative that you don't get with uh, pairs of glasses on your face, even though they're a technology that changed humanity or the printing press or the spinning jenny or any historical example of a disruptive technology. It's only really the internet gets at a certain amount. Um, some of the early discussions from a more metaphysical direction about the internet was about whether this was a new form of consciousness, whether we would see emergent properties from it, kind of more the fringe ideas. And I love the film Tron uh, and its sequel, even though it was a much derided sequel. Um, this idea of emergence of life and new forms of uh, being on, on a digital platform fantastic sci-fi and that's the distinction i think i make as well with this big big t form of technology with ai as a part of it is that it's actually taking us to conversations about personhood and being and intelligence however construed um, and that's not something you necessarily see with the water wheel or fire uh, Oh, actually, fire is an interesting example. I suppose that's slightly different because there were theistic conceptions of fire. Uh, I don't think there was many conceptions of it as a person, though. Well, when we talk about conceptions of robots as people and personification and this keyword here, consciousness, this is something that I've seen come up in your work. And in the last of the documentary series, Ghost in the Machine, it talks all about AI consciousness. So could you tell us a bit about um, what it means for an AI to be conscious, at least as of what we know now, and if you think that's ever possible? Yeah. Well, go, going back to what I said about our ambition to do consciousness in 15 minutes, I mean, it, it, it was, again, a, a part of the learning process to say, well, there's this big thing and this big thing that we have a big conversation about. How can we pass that for the general public? And even for myself, that this is not a subject I feel I have any kind of uh, authority to state what consciousness is, but I wanted as an anthropologist to say, well, what are, what are the dominant conversations? And the dominant framing tends to be that there is something, uh, a dualistic conception of mind and body, and, and we come up again and again with the expression that in the West we believe, and this is placed in contrast to in the East. There's a lot of quotation marks I'll do at this point. Um, and that narrative is very interesting to me, this distinction between mind and body and also the assumption that other people in other parts of the world don't make that distinction in the same way. And, and again, going back to what I was saying about the, the kind of the teleology of um, our enlightenment assumptions about rationality, this assumption that if we see the mind and body in this way, we're actually more rational than people who see it in a more holistic direction. And that's characterized as being in the East. So having the conversation about consciousness in the, the fourth film, again, for me, was about playing out some of these discussions, engaging with some of the more serious academics who've spent their entire lives talking about consciousness, whereas I've come along and gone, I need to understand this. Um, and I don't think at any point we felt comfortable saying there is a solution to this question. I don't think there could possibly be one. I, li I like the fact that we're having this conversation. It says a lot about our concerns um, and where we think we want to draw boundaries between groups. And one of the things I wanted to bring out in both in the fourth film and more generally is that these conversations are obviously not new. Historically, we, 
white privileged Western folks have gone to other places and gone, hmm, does that have consciousness? Does that entity have consciousness? If we ever did encounter aliens, we'd have the same conversation again. It doesn't behave in the same way that we do. Does it have consciousness? So these boundary workings, oh, and women as well. There's, there's the other primary example of like the eternal conversation. Do women have the same consciousness as men that led to so many discussions and fraught incidences and tensions throughout history and we're still not resolved on that one or obviously still not resolved on the rights and our moral rights to behave in certain ways to different groups and this will keep happening again and again and ai and robotics has kind of fallen into this discussion um for some people that's a problematic thing any discussion of the consciousness of robots for some academics is a distraction away from the the rights and the responsibilities of the corporations who are using AI and robots. So if you, you start talking about the personhood of robots, you're not looking at the corporate structure behind it and that they see as a fudge, basically, a, a, sorry, a way of distracting away from what we should expect corporations to do. And I think that's that's a fair comment, but it also the fact that we're having these conversations again about personhood just should remind us that we've always had these conversations about personhood and hopefully we become more progressive and treating other humans better in a speculative future does that mean we should treat robots better again i always remain agnostic <laughs> well and, and you've you've alluded to an answer to this question but um i'm curious if you can say more about um I guess why this all matters is the question, because it's I, I feel like sometimes my experience has been sometimes, especially in religious study spaces, it can get very uh, intellectual. Like I can study Durkheim for a long time and then apply it to robots. And and that's wonderful. Um, but especially in this podcast where we're looking at AI ethics and some of the justice applications um, for folks who may be seeing this as a purely like intellectual pursuit. I'm wondering if you can put a finer point on why these conversations, especially about consciousness and AI matter. Yeah, I think I think that point that some academics make about the uh, corporate responsibility and the, the focus on robot rights being a bit of a distraction is, is key. I want to also link that back to what I was talking about, science fiction and science facts, that some of these people who are promoting particular robots, perhaps a female looking robot who sometimes appears on chat shows, they are giving a presentation of AI that's disingenuous and leads people into a conversation about personhood and rights that perhaps could be seen as a distraction from actually what's happening. And the same thing, as I said, with the more dystopic interpretations of robots that if you focus too much on the Terminator stories, you don't notice um, the examples of AI being used in parole services, using uh, basically digital phys I can never say this word, physiognomy. No, uh, I'll go with phrenology. It's slightly easy to say, but you know what I mean. It's looking at people's features and obviously people from ethnic minority groups and using existing bias data, which of course you know about this, but uh, using bias data and making assumptions based on people's appearances, that it, that account that story doesn't hit the mainstream public uh, consciousness quite in the same way as the Terminator does. And actually, I think what's quite interesting about the most recent Terminator film is that they try to tackle some of those issues. If you've seen it, no spoilers, but I think the, the evolution of the Terminator film is something that the representation of Terminators in user reports about AI doesn't take on board, that actually we're still just seeing the original kind of T2 Arnie coming with the gun, whereas the most recent film actually had some things to say about the rights of minorities, about the role of women, um, particularly, I, I try not to do spoilers, but in case people listening haven't seen it, but particularly about who gets to be the messiah? Like, whose role is it? Uh, Terminator films all along the way have had quite theistic narratives, quite Judeo-Christian, uh, well, Christian-specifically narratives. And that's something that I think has evolved over time. And I think it's important, therefore, to pay attention to how those changes and shifts are happening in the AI narratives that are going about at the moment. Uh, I have seen the new Terminator film, and I will vouch for all the listeners to go watch it because it is very good. It's the only one I saw, so I, I'm not like a Terminator aficionado, but can can agree that it's a great way to view AI in, in the modern day and age. Uh, and I did Beth, make the mistake. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, go for it. Oh, it's just, just a flippant comment. I did make the mistake on Twitter recently of listing my favorite Terminator films in order. And then, of course, everyone came back with, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm not. These are my favorites. Yeah, Dark Fates, the latest one, is up there for me. 
Mm, that's when you have to preface the tweet with unpopular opinions so that yes, people don't absolutely. expect anything from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Beth, you are on uh, the Radical AI podcast. And something that we like to ask to all of our guests uh, is kind of a two-part question. So the first part is, how do you define the word radical? And how do you situate your work in that definition, if you do at all? Okay. So I gave this a lot of thought. I had a bit of prep time on this one. Um, and I think how I'd like to define radical is non-algorithmic thinking. So one of the worrying things about this teleology of the direction of uh, technological progress and the, the rush towards AI is that actually we're instituting algorithmic thinking systematically everywhere. And this is, you know, this has been happening for a long time before even AI was muted. You know, we were trying to find ways to make businesses more efficient, you know, systems theory. This isn't entirely new, but I think the more and more we instill machine learning algorithmic systems into our processes, the more and more we accept that algorithmic thinking is the only way forward. And the most basic form of the algorithm is data in, data out. And if the data is biased, if the data is historically wrong, that just keeps us in the same like fur fur furrow line, like on farming, like you stay in the same furrow. Um, I think a good example of this is when uh, the big conference neural, I will get this wrong, neural imaging processes systems, NeurIPS, now NeurIPS was NIPS. And one of the problems with that acronym is that, yes, it, it reminds people of lady parts of nipples and also it had sort of racist, racist connotations. But when they surveyed their members and said, do you have a problem with this acronym? The majority who were majority male, white of a certain age said, no, it's fine. Like this is what it's always been. And we're happy with this. This is tradition. This is how it's been. Whereas the minority who are perhaps younger female from ethnic groups said, no, actually, we're not comfortable with this. Can we change it? So if you rely purely on that kind of survey data of existing uh, biases, the algorithmic thinking will lead you into the same solution. And they had to basically go against the survey to change the name. And now it's NeurIPS. Um, so I think to be radical is to try and find a way to get out of the comfortable zone of similar thinking of uh, replicating historical data of bad data in bad data out and the more that we use artificial intelligence without that kind of frame of critical th thinking and just assuming that when the computer says yes or no the computer is right the more that we as humans broadly constructed will continue uh, existing path lines that don't help people that don't recognize difference and don't recognize the ability for change as well um, and was the second part how I see my work as radical? Was that? Yeah. Do do you based on that definition? Yeah. Do you link it into uh, into it? Well, I think I think on paper I'm probably I don't come across as hugely radical. I think there's um, the expectation of someone who has spent most of their academic career at Cambridge. Um, is probably not to be that radical and different, but and the nature of academia itself that you know the process of citation is about looking to the past and building on uh, previous research, while also trying to push the boundaries. And I think that's where my religious studies side is useful because it's unexpected for anyone to be discussing AI with anything like a religious studies lens. Um, increasingly, there are people I'm meeting that's great, and be meeting people who are doing this. And also just to be an arts and humanities scholar in the AI ecosystem, there are some great research institutes with people who are doing history, sociology, anthropology and philosophy and so forth. But the majority of people who are doing the actual physical working on AI tend to be computer scientists or mathematicians of some strand. So having other voices coming in from the arts and humanities side is useful. How much they're listened to does vary. So I've given talks at places like Amazon and others. And, you know, it's interesting to have that interaction with people who perhaps haven't thought anthropologically before and trying to encourage them to think about the human elements of the research they're doing. And obviously there's lots of ethicists out there who are trying to do the same sort of push of saying, you know, the ethical concerns that we have about artificial intelligence need to be in the discussion from the very beginning um, and seeing who's in the room to have the conversations. So I suppose, you know, I, I recognize my my Cambridge privilege and my the, uh, the the Cambridge stuffiness that suggests sometimes that we can't be radical, but 
also uh, the history of Cambridge is full of radical people. Um, so my college actually was founded and the very first people involved were non-conformist Christians. Uh, most colleges in Cambridge have a Christian background, but they, you know, they weren't Church of England in the UK. They were dissenters. And I think there's a there's a political history in my college that suits me quite well as well. We have you know, connections with various different political figures from the 18th and 19th centuries and 20th centuries. So I think that's a comfortable place to be a dissenter um, and sort of push against the assumptions again about what Cambridge is like as well. So as we close the interview, we normally ask some level of, of advice question. And I'm really taken by your um, career as a screenwriter. And then our conversation about um, the Terminator and ways that people are spin these narratives about artificial intelligence. And I'm wondering if you had any piece of advice for someone who's writing a screenplay about something like the Terminator, writing a screenplay about like telling a story, basically a fictional, possibly fictional story about artificial intelligence. What would your piece of advice be? So as I say, I recognize the value in science fiction that goes full bore into either utopian or dystopian. I mean, that there, there, there is an audience for that. And I think it's enjoyable and I will never stop going to see Terminator films or going to see dystopic films. You know, if there's a, a robot war, I'm there, I will watch it. I will enjoy it. And I think that's the equivalent basically of going on the fairground rides and like being scared witless, but getting off and going, well, you know, I know that was the robot ride. So I'm all for those. I, I, I long may they continue i also like to see the stories that do something unexpected um that don't play into the obvious tropes as well and there's been a few lately um have you seen mother that's quite interesting you know it does some of the dystopic things but you know it's a different form of relationship and as i say terminator dark fate did some interesting things i wasn't expecting so i think there's certainly space for speculative futures that turn the audience's expectations on themselves let's not always see the terrible robot war, but also have a space for that. I'm just saying, just keep writing. You know, there's so many stories can be told. I'd love to read and see them all. Well, Beth, if anyone wants to um, engage with your work and your stories and your writing, where is the best place for them to go for that? Uh, I have my own website, uh, bvlsingler.com. I'm pretty Googleable. I am a Twitterholic. Uh, I'm often tweeting more than I, I should be. I should be writing more than I'm tweeting. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm annoyingly around. One of the things about being a digital ethnographer is that to, to do your work, you need to be online. And that's always been my excuse. For you know, during my PhD, everyone said, "Get off Twitter, get off Facebook. You need to write." My, how do I do my research otherwise? But yeah, there's a fine line between researching and just tweeting everything that's in my mind. I know that. But yeah, so I'm quite easy to find online, and happy to chat. And we strongly recommend Beth's uh, Twitter feed. It's it's very entertaining <laughs> and informative. Uh, so we wholly it's, endorse it's, it. It's, <laughs> I think it's changed recently. Like I, I realize uh, there's a, still a certain amount of AI and robot stuff, but you know everything else that's happening, it's very hard not to be constantly ranting about my government at the moment. But yeah, I, I will try and ensure some, some useful, humorous things as well. Well, Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed chatting. Thank you very much. We want to thank Dr. Beth Singler again for joining us today for this wonderful conversation. And one of the first things that's coming to my mind after interviewing with Beth is everything that we were talking about in terms of multimedia and public outreach when it comes to AI ethics. Maybe I'm a bit biased because uh, Dylan and I are currently doing public outreach and multimedia for AI ethics in multiple realms. So clearly we are huge advocates for this kind of approach. Um, But I really loved what Beth was talking about in terms of getting the public involved in the discussion on AI so that The general public is not just hearing headlines about killer robots and Terminator stories, right? So everybody's getting informed about uh, what she called the invisible killer robots, which is the algorithms and really the heart of the matter here. Yeah, my my jam in all of this is like narratives around uh, AI and artificial intelligence and it's like uh, utopian visions about AI and then the dystopia visions and then the reality in between all of that. Um, and I, I just love Beth's scholarship, 
around this, especially when she starts talking about the Terminator and all that stuff. Like I, I remember watching the Terminator when I was like, what? I'm going to date myself here. Like, uh, <laughs> eight years old, I think. Anyway, I was eight years old when I watched it. I don't know if it was coming out around that time. And uh, I just remember being so terrified. And that has <laughs> had such a lasting um, impact on the way that I think about robotics in both like good and negative ways. Uh, like even someone who's like in the, you know, inside baseball area right now of being in the academy researching the stuff. Um, these narratives persist. And, you know, just how many people like that we talk to who are like, you know, I got into this field because I watched Star Trek right, as a kid, or I got into this field because of this story about science fiction. And it's, um, I think it's really important for us to chronicle and codify some of these narratives that are out there and to, like, understand that the way that we tell these stories have real consequences, uh, even in fiction. Um, and then, of course, the other reason why I love talking to Beth is because, as I, I mentioned in our intro, uh, as a religious studies PhD, I just... I love the work that she's done with, uh, say, new religious movements and uh, all these big questions of purpose and meaning and where AI plays into these big questions of what it means to be human. Because, um, again, that's 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 my thing. And I'm like, oh, someone else is researching that. That's great. Uh, and, and doing such an amazing, amazing job, too. Well, I think what you brought up about science fiction and both sides of the coin is actually really important to talk about here because we have the positives of science fiction in our ability to reimagine speculative futures for AI. And I think that science fiction, especially out of any other form of media, is just such a beneficial tool that we can use to actually take ourselves out of the reality that we currently live in so that we can think about a future that we maybe can't even fathom in the way that the world currently exists. And so science fiction can be a great tool in order to actually think about the unintended consequences of technology, especially when it comes to AI ethics. And this is something that even my PhD advisor, Casey Fiesler, is doing quite a bit with things like the Black Mirror Writers Room and the Computer Science Classroom. And then on the other side of the coin, though, we also have science fiction being used almost as this like thought weapon to scare uh, society about AI and the future of AI. And that's where we get these Terminator stories. And a lot of uh, organizations in the tech industry are using the platforms that they have to um, kind of create whatever narrative that they want. And it's it's almost science fiction in a way. And without informing the public about what is really going on, um, that's when science fiction can actually you know, be detrimental as opposed to science fact, which is what Beth was talking about quite a bit in our interview, which is much more beneficial for at least democratic deliberation. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned, uh, what was it, thought weapon <laughs> there, because it's it's such like a science fiction term, right? Like I, I go immediately to like 1984 and like dystopia yeah. visions of like double think and things like that. And all of that is, um, it's alive, right? It's all alive in this like, cultural milieu of, of a soup. Uh, but it's also why it's so important that these questions of representation are not just questions of, you know, how do we better do representation in the boardroom or in like these narrow ways, right? That's very important, right? But there's also like representation of how AI gets seen in popular media as well. Even like what science fiction authors uh, we share and and we know about. Like I know that my reading list, say in high school, when we did like our science fiction unit, it was mostly white male authors. And that's not the, like there are plenty of black or non-white authors of science fiction out there who have written some incredible things and are currently writing some incredible things. And they don't always get the same amount of uh, airtime, um, probably because of, you know, the, the systemic racism that's embedded in our society. Uh, but it's something that I think we really need to be intentional about as people doing AI ethics that even these bigger stories, like not just the people that are coding, but like these bigger stories that we're telling about what we're working on, a representation matters and who gets seen matters. Yeah, that's so true. And I mean, this also is just touching on the fact that storytelling and narrative building is a tool for power. And it's a way to express power in whatever platform that you're telling stories about. And we talked about this a lot with different guests on our show, especially with um, Lily Arani and with Karen Howe. 
storytelling can be incredibly powerful and building a narrative can build a movement or dismantle a movement or um, entirely define a field like AI and and what it means for the future and, and what we want AI to be in the future and what we don't want AI to be in the future. And I think I think like one of the most important parts about that, and and I think Beth's interview gets to the heart of this too, is that we're always writing a narrative to some degree. Like we're always telling a story, uh, and we're that means there's always power involved. And I know I've probably said this before at some point, but I really believe it. Yes, Dylan. I mean, we clearly love talking about power on this show. You know, algorithms are power, data is power, storytelling is power, narratives are power, AI is power, time is power, and speaking of time. We are out of it. So for more information on today's show, please visit the episode page at RadicalAI.org. And if you enjoy this episode, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Join our conversation on Twitter at RadicalAIPod. And as always, stay radical. metaphor as much as I can because it's such a good meta metaphor <laughs> meta soup meta soup <laughs> whoa <laughs> this is a symbolism wow, we should write a paper about back. the meta soup that we're all swimming in about AI ethics the AI ethics meta soup I'd drink it <laughs> <laughs> I'd drink that last part. <laughs>